Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Our third panel, which will be uh, Lynn M. from the Oakland Mills Group, Larry F. from the 12 Steps to Life Group, and Dave N. from the Bowie Friday Night Speakers Group. Uh, They'll be sharing their experience on Steps 8 and 9, which are made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all, and made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. So I'll turn it over to them. I'm an alcoholic. My name's Dave. 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 Exact. And... uh, my sobriety date is October 9th of 2000. My home group is the Bowie Friday Night Speakers Group, and um, I'd like to thank the committee for having me uh, out to talk today. Uh, I can stand closer to the mic, much closer to the mic. And, uh, <laughs> you know, um, do a time check here. I uh, got to, arrived at steps eight and nine by going through one through seven. And um, although, I will say, um, and we'll talk about this some in Living Amends, um, I started making amends to my family long before I wrote uh, the eighth and ninth step list. Um, I didn't realize that at the time, although someone did tell me that. Um, the um, the eighth step list, uh, as it says in our big book, um, came, uh, the majority of it came from my four step. I won't say that all of it came from my four step. I was not resentful at people that I had robbed. I just wasn't angry at them. Um, and uh, so... I owed them money nonetheless, but uh, I certainly had no resentment. And, and, and to be honest, I wasn't scared of most of them, so they didn't even make my fears list. They just they just kind of missed the, the gap there. But nonetheless, they were um, on my amends list. And the funny thing uh, about when I wrote my, my A-step list, which um, it took me a little bit longer than I had anticipated, anticipated originally, um, it took me a couple of weeks to write it. But uh, when I when I did my first review of the list, I really felt as though um, the people that I had robbed and done those types of things to, the people I owed money to, that those were going to be the hard amends, um, and that the ones to my family are going to be the easy amends because my family loves me and you know my mom's very nice and uh, I really kind of expected through the amends process maybe some cookies and. Uh, uh, a hug. I don't know. I just sort of had this very flowery outlook on what the process was going to be like with my parents. Um, and the process of those people that I owed money was going to be very hard and dangerous. And, um, yeah. So, uh, before I get to the process of making some amends, I'll say that, uh, the, the step, uh, summarized and, and made a list and became willing to make amends to them all. And, and that was really two parts for me. Um, I made that list and I reviewed it with my sponsor, um, Dave, who was on the last panel and, and we talked about some things and, um, he did uh, take a couple of amends off my uh, list because it would have been more harmful to, to make that amend than it would have been to, you know, to take them off. And so, um, there was a number of folks that really just, you know, I wanted to really to tell them how good I was doing. That was kind of my primary motivation. And, uh, so. They didn't, they didn't make the list and they were of the, the female persuasion generally. And, uh, so I think, you know, my alcoholic compass just sort of navigated me there, but that's why we have sponsors, I suppose. And, um, but anyway, so I, I became instantly unwilling at the, uh, when the list was finished. And, um, I didn't know that that had happened, but, you know, I went through the process of four and five and, um, although I did find out a lot of bad stuff about myself in that process, I also got de-uniqued, and I was still kind of riding out the, the good feeling of being a full-fledged member of Alcoholics Anonymous, of having a, a real picture of who you were, of who I was, that God loved me. I had all this great stuff going on, and that meant I didn't have to do anything for a little bit. Um, and I didn't consciously say that, but I wasn't doing anything. So um, there you have it. Uh, what happened to me is that um, I became motivated to do my amends by a series of circumstances. Uh, I was sober a, a little while at this point, over a year for sure, and um, I um, was with my friends who I'd reconnected with, people I grew up with, and I was walking in a uh, restaurant that I had worked at, um, you know, uh, the prodigal son, so to speak, in, in my mind. And uh, the prodigal son was walking in with all his, his friends, and someone that he had robbed for several thousand dollars was walking out with all of their friends. And... Um, and in a split second, um, 
you know, I realized that something bad was about to happen. And, um, you know, you don't want to get in a, in a brawl, uh, in, over an amends you haven't made with your new friends you, you know, your old friends that you've connected with since you're sober with someone that you robbed when you were drinking. That's, that's poor form. And, uh, and I knew that. And so I did what I always did in those situations is I walked in the front and I walked out the back. And, um, uh, and that was, that was a very miserable feeling. Cause I was working with guys at this point. I'm really trying to do the right stuff. And, uh, you know, sitting in that car, I, I, I realized that it was time to, to clean up the past in a very real way. Um, and I am, you know, there's a lot of people in Alcoholics Anonymous that are motivated by enlightenment. I, I, I'm very impressed by you. I'm motivated by pain generally. And, uh, and so, and so there, there it goes. And then, then the amends, I got started with them in earnest and, um, you know, we go back to what I said earlier, the um, the amends that uh, I thought were going to be very difficult were the, the amends to the people that I had done shady stuff to when I was out there. I was not um, was not a very nice young man at that time, and um, and I did what I had to do. And, and generally speaking, if if you became a, an easy target, I took it. And um, and easy targets are people that trust you, you know. And they're the easiest. That's why, for me, that's why I hurt my family the most. That's why I hurt the people I grew up with the most. Because we were sort of past the trust thing, and they, and they had my well-being in mind. And so I manipulated that to get what I wanted. There's a lot of my ASAP list was that type of thing. And so, um, but I, you know, you give someone a check or some cash for money you owe them, they're generally pretty, you know, pretty chill. And, uh... <laughs> Regardless of what their background might be or their current, you know, employment, legal or otherwise. And, um, and so my fears were very, uh, my, and my expectations for the immense process were, were really misplaced. Um, just because I hadn't done them yet. And so I started making all these amends to people that I had ripped off. And, and in the end, uh, they, they were, uh, pretty happy to have money. And, and that was that, you know. And uh, to be honest with you, uh, if they asked what, what this was all about, I, I told them I was sober and Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't kind of lead with the chin like the book talks about, you know, spouting great tidings of spiritual sobriety and how great everything was. I just, I, I, I owed them money and I kept it very simple. And, um, you know, and most, and by that time, to be honest, the, the rumor mill being what it is where I grew up, most people already knew that I was sober. And, um, and that, you know, and that was kind of the, the first part of the list and, the second part, which is ongoing uh, and will be ongoing, um, as as far as I can see right now, and as far as the the examples that I have in my life, till my family uh, passes on and then beyond that. So I'm going to go ahead and say, for the rest of my life, I'll be making those amends, and um, and those are the amends to my family. Uh, so my um, my mother and stepfather uh, raised me. And, um, my father, uh, my mother and father were divorced when I was very young. My father was in my life, um, and he's a lot, he's a self-described one of us. And, uh, so we had a very, very interesting relationship, uh, when I was a teenager. And, uh, it was more like peers, to be honest. And I had a very typical father-son, uh, mother-son relationship with my, uh, stepfather and mother. And so, I, when I made the uh, initial amends, you know, when I outlined the harms um, and uh, to my mother, I thought I really, like I said, I thought it was going to be a hug. Um, we just wanted you to get better, and uh, you know, it was going to be very Hallmark esque, and uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't. It was uh, very different than that. Um, my mom, I, I did not, you know, even though I did my absolute best to honestly take a look at my part, and I wrote all these things down. Um, I had no concept of what I had done to my family. I had no concept of it. And, and, and I mean, truthfully, I really couldn't have until I, my mother gave me her optic on things and the fact that she hadn't slept a decent night's sleep since I was 15 years old um, because of the things I was doing. And, um, you know, and I was a, a kid that had a lot of potential and they put a lot of time and effort into making sure that I realized that potential through sports and, you know, doing well at school. And they lined me up with a lot of different things. They, they were really engaged in good parents. And I used that to my advantage. And in the end, before I got sober, I had stolen from them so much that they just simplified it. They just put the money on the counter. And I thought that was impressive. Like I, that was something I bragged about, truthfully. 
uh, when, when I was out there was that, you know, I don't know, it just seemed really cool to me at the time because it, it took a lot of guesswork out of stealing. And, uh, <laughs> so a different set of principles I lived by then. And, um, and it, it's because I had, you know, I had done the army low crawl into my parents' room and stolen money while they were sleeping. I had, uh, I had, and, uh, you know, I had stolen my mom's credit card and, you know, bought a bunch of stuff and, you know, violated their trust in, uh, just myriad ways. I mean, it was, you know, the kind of thing that erodes any good relationship. Um, and I, uh, talked to my mother about amends and that was the beginning of the amends process. That is ongoing to this day. It's going fairly well after 12 years, but um, I got a real picture of who and what I was in that in that moment and where I was really at in in, in a way that hadn't really sunk in in my fist. If I knew a lot about me, you know, and um, you know my causes and conditions, and that I was run on fear and uh, resentment, but I didn't really have um, an idea of the proximity damage that I had done until that moment. Um, and ongoing from that, to be honest with you, because my family didn't trust me until I had five years sobriety at all. I mean, they let me back in the house at a certain point, but there was always a very watchful eye, you know, and that's the kind of damage I did. And I was doing all the right stuff. I was going to five meetings a week, sponsoring people, bringing people in the house to do step work. They were meeting everybody from AA. My sponsor came and picked me up. They went to my anniversaries, all that stuff. And it really took five years for them to be like, okay, this might actually work. You know, I had some expectations about that, but I was reminded of, of those things that I had done and the, the pattern that I had lived uh, up until that point. And they didn't really have any good concrete reason to believe that I was going to stay sober and do the right thing for the long haul because I am a great starter. I am a great starter. I am a terrible finisher. And uh, and they knew that. And so the process uh, of amends, and I'll wrap my stepfather up in here too because it was the same kind of thing. Here's a man who I'm not his son, and he treated me like his son. He raised me. He took me. He was my football coach. He did all the things that a father should do. And I wasn't his son. He did it because he loved my mother. And uh, and he's a great man. He would never, you know, and he's really humble. He doesn't talk a whole lot. And uh, But if you watch his actions, he is, he is one of the greatest examples that I have in my life about just how to be a normal, good human being. And he raised me, and I hated him. Now, and in part, I hated him because he wasn't my father, and I was a little bitter about all that stuff. And I took it out on him because he was, you know, the easiest target, but, um, that, that went beyond that, you know, when I was a teenager and, um, and he mostly stayed out of the, the fray with my mom and I, and I don't know how he had the patience or the love to not kill me. Seriously, I would have killed me if I was him. And, um, at least, at least through a right cross at, you know, certain intervals, there's definitely times where I wouldn't have treated me as well as he did. Um, and we weren't on speaking terms when I got sober. Um, we did not talk. We spoke through my mother. And at a period of time, my mom just said she was no longer going to play Switzerland and we were going to have to talk like normal people. And I think I was sober a couple of years, maybe two years at that time. And we began to like communicate directly. Um, and I said the, the, you know, I outlined the harms and, and he basically said, just keep doing what you're doing, you know? And, uh, the, um, and, and when I say the process of amends, um, it, it has been a process for, for me. And part of it has been doing all the stuff here and just living the right way and trying to be an example in my family and showing up and doing all the things that I say I'm going to do over a long period of time. And little by slowly, those relationships began to rebuild very slowly. Um, but I will say that my stepfather and I, um, in particular, and he's probably the relationship that when I look at my life in the process of the amends, it has really transformed in a way that I can clearly see uh, the power of Alcoholics Anonymous, the power of God in my life, uh, the power of example of the uh, men and women that have gone on before me, like that it really has transformed that relationship. And um, I'm very grateful for that. My stepfather is a devout Notre Dame fan. And, uh, and, and he, you know, raised me and taught me how to play football and was my coach and all that stuff. So I also am a devout Notre Dame fan and, uh, having a very good season. But, uh, a few years ago, um, 
you know, we started to watch football together again, maybe about seven years ago when I was about five years sober. And we started watching football together, and that was how we connected, and we talked about football. And then, you know, we went from football to talking about life, and I started to remember things like his birthday and Father's Day and do all the, the things that I should have been doing all along. And, um, you know, one of the uh, highlights of my sobriety, um, you know, through having a decent job and having some money, I was able to take him um, to South Bend and uh, go see a Notre Dame football game, um, their homecoming game down there. And um, and uh, and it was awesome. It was awesome to walk across the quad with him and, you know, see uh, what we affectionately call Notre Dame terms, touchdown Jesus on the uh, behind the uh, building there. And uh, just to see the look on his face and to have that experience with him um, was pretty amazing. And from... And that was really only three years after, you know, Switzerland stopped communicating for us. And, uh, you know, relationships that are that damaged don't generally heal up that fast in my experience. Um, and we have a great relationship today. Last night was my 12th anniversary, and uh, so it was when I celebrated anyway. And it was his birthday, you know, and I gave him a card for his birthday, and we talked about his birthday. And, you know, and, and it's kind of funny because his... Um, his sons aren't really, you know, they don't communicate him with him that much. And my father and I have a very strained relationship. And I've sort of become his son, and he's become my father, you know. And uh, and I don't say that to hurt anyone's feelings, you know. It's just the truth. And that would have never happened without the process of the men's, the immense. I would have never been able, in a million years, I'd have never thought of the 12 steps. Let me get that out there. But the process of identifying my part and just ident- and saying, this is what I've done. Please help me to make this right. And... And it wasn't going to be an overnight matter. I want things to happen now, you know. And it's not now. It's little by little, and for me anyway. And uh, and those relationships are some of the most important I have in my life. The uh, the other thing that I will say is um, through living that way and being allowed to be sober and Alcoholics Anonymous, um, the amends process and some of the other things that AA has to offer has touched other parts of my family. And... Um, you know, last night was, uh, again, I got to celebrate an anniversary and, um, uh, you know, a good portion of my family was there. And there's an, a couple other cousins of mine that are in Alcoholics Anonymous. One of them made all the food here today and, um, or a lot of it. And, uh, <laughs> and being able to, um, to go for, for me from the black sheep in the family, I mean, just the black sheep in the family, uh, to someone who gets cards like, thank you for, you know, helping to save my son's life, you know. And, and I know that that is the power that lies in Alcoholics Anonymous. That is a God of my understanding expressed through actions that you taught me over a long, long period of time. Um, but it's really cool to be a part of that, you know. And um, all my amends aren't done. I, I, I need to say that um, because they aren't. Um, I, uh, I have some folks on my uh, list that are identified by... You know, the things I can remember them by. The person I robbed for $1,500 at approximately this date, this time, who looks like this, you know. I don't know who they are. I just don't, you know. I, I try to remain willing, and uh, if that opportunity presents itself, I will make those amends, you know. And there's some other ones that, you know, I've tried to make, and um, they were sort of put on the back burner by the person that I tried to make the amends to, and they're going to be there for a while until that person takes action. I don't, I don't feel compelled to take them off because I still owe them that amend. You know, I don't feel like uh, it's off the list, and um, maybe they will or maybe they won't um, decide at some point that they want uh, that amend to be made. And, and for, for the moment, my part is just to keep them on the list and take a look at it every now and again and remember that uh, I still owe. Um, when I was brand, brand new, um, my first sponsor told me that, uh, that I was making amends long before I knew it, and he was right. The most important amends that I make is uh, doing the right thing on a daily basis to you know, to keep my family away from sleepless nights, um, and just doing the right thing and trying to be an example of what, um, what I've seen here in Alcoholics Anonymous since I got here. Um, like I said, it's a continuing ongoing process. It's probably the most beautiful thing in my life, except for working with others. And, um, thanks for letting me share. Hey, everybody. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Lynn. Amen. Due to the grace of God and Alcoholics Anonymous, I've been sober since November 28, 1996, and for that I'm eternally grateful. 
Uh, I am a member of the Oakland Mills Wednesday night group. Um, I have a sponsor. Uh, I'm lucky enough to be a sponsor. Those are all the vital statistics. Uh, thank you very much for uh, whomever got me um, into this. Um, <laughs> uh, I consider it an honor and a privilege, not a right, to do stuff like this. Um, I read someplace kind of recently that um, the things that I take for granted are other people's prayers. Um, so the fact that I have a sobriety date and I'm blessed to be able to do stuff like this is something I never want to take for granted. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, and again, to whomever uh, put my name in a hat. <clears throat> um, you know, the, the previous panels kind of set it up pretty easy for me. Uh, they told, you know, sections of my story and got me to the eighth step. But uh thing is, as I arrived at the eighth step and, and what my sponsor, I'm going to tell the greatest hits, right? So what I do with the sponsees. So the, the sponsees today and what I practice in the eighth step is this. So I sit down with a blank piece of paper, and for three nights in a row, I sit down and I talk to God, and I tell God while I'm there. And I say, God, what I need you to do is I need you to give me the list of the people that I need to make amends to. I look at the clock, and I say, here we go. I'm going to give you 15 minutes and three nights. And I close my eyes and I wait. And I will tell you this. The sponsor that I had that started me on that process said, you will be amazed. And I will tell you that people started coming through the woodwork. And I was like, really? Seriously? And she said, just write it down. Just write it down. And I wrote it down. And I followed the process. And I did it for three nights. And I waited for 15 minutes and I wrote down everybody. Um, it does say... In the book, and uh, Dave said on page 67, there's a couple sentences in there on that page that if you go to it, it's about in the middle of the book, but it talks about a harms list. Um, talks about we have no, you know, nothing in connection with it. You just write it down. And so I did. Um, I refer the women that I sponsor to those two sentences. Um, it also says um, that we do the majority of that this step on that four step. So I also take that, that list. I bring it over here, but I take those names. Um, but the thing is, is that for me, Step eight is an intensely spiritual step because of the fact that by the time I've gotten to this point, what I realize is that the people on that list, the vast majority of them, number one, they're unbelievably close to me. Um, because what I've done is that I figured out that my biggest fear in the world is the fact that I'm not good enough, that I have absolutely no value and I'm not good enough. So I have, I have set in chain a, a set of behaviors, right, that is all based on that fear. So I'm acting out of that broken chain of experience. And the, the thing is, is that because of that broken chain of experience and because of that fear, the thing is, is that I don't want to forgive anybody. Because if I forgive you, the issue is, is that then you have more power over me. So because of that, I want to hold on to that and I'm going to, I'm going to hold, I'm going to keep that because that's the only power I've left in the world is that lack of forgiveness. And I'm going to hold on to it until my dying day. And that was a big thing because, because, you know, the thing that we talk about, the hole in the donut, they talk about that in terms of resentment. And that wasn't the issue for me. It was forgiveness. And I will tell you that the wall started to crumble one night when I was sitting in the college park group. And that was one of my first, uh, uh, that was actually my first home group when I moved to the state of Maryland. Um, and a guy was talking about the fact that, and John, correct me if I'm wrong after this. He talked about a guy, a kid that he grew up with, that he would get beat up every day after school. And he walked home and he talked to his dad about it and how he was so upset. And his dad said, yeah, but think about what's going on with him every day when he gets home, that he's treating you like that. So what happened with me with the eighth step is that I started a compassion practice is people talk to me about the people that were on that list that I had resented for so long and that, that I was so fearful about. And I started to put myself in their shoes. I needed to start to forgive them, and I needed to start to, to spin that, to flip that script, to look at it, to say, what, what was the dynamic between the two of us so that I could start to forgive them, so that little by little I could open up my hand and that I could say, I'm going to give, I'm not going to give the power to you, but the thing is, is that that connection that is still between the two of us, 
I'm going to let that go because the problem is that I am every day I'm getting up and I'm stabbing myself and I am waiting for you to bleed. And the problem is, is that until I forgive you and then start to have forgiveness for myself, this connection is going to be between the two of us and I am never going to have the willingness to make amends to you. And, and that was the biggest link. And so the biggest, the biggest distance that I had to go was to get to the point where I would be, be willing to make amends to anybody. Um, so finally, once I, I got to that point, and, and let me tell you something. At this point in, in, in this whole thing, in this whole shebang, I'm like nine years sober. <laughs> um, because the thing is, is that I had gone through and I had made amends to people. I had walked through this. Right? But the, the thing is, is that when I've gone through the compulsive reactions of making some of these amends, I didn't have spectacular stories, right? A lot of my relationships were still broken. And I was waiting for a lot of that. I was waiting for a lot of that stuff to happen. But the problem was is that I woke up one day at, at, at eight years, between eight and yeah, nine years sober, and I was walking through the door of my home with, you know, a marriage that was falling apart. But I'd walk through the door, and I, I'd, I'd, I'd scrape the principles off on my doorstep. You know, and I was looking around and my life was falling apart. My parents wouldn't speak to me. We would go in six and, and five year stints without talking. You know, and I was, I was working the steps again. And finally I arrived at a point where I had to stop being a loyal, laurel rester. And I sort of had needed to, to work, really work the ninth step because that's where the magic started to happen. And the thing is, is that I'd started to, I, I was making amends to people and I had expectations. Right. So I had, I had written some of these letters and I had expectations that the relationships were going to change. I was making amends to people and I was having expectations that these things were really magically just going to happen. And what, what the thing is, is people were talking about, and let me kind of talk about, I, I'm, I was not raised in AA that said that there were living amends. I was raised in AA that said you make direct amends, that that's what the step says. And I've searched the literature and, 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 and they've said that there's not direct amend, that there's not living amends, that you make direct amends and then you move on and that you practice the 12 principles. Actually, you practice 30, 36 principles. Um, and then what happens is that your life begins to change. And that's what I found is that I started to go to people and I started to make direct amends, not just writing letters. I started to have conversations with people that said, I lied to you. And I cheated. And I would like to know specifically what I can do to make up for that. And I shut up. And it was painful. And it was uncomfortable. And I hated it. But then I, I did what, what they said. I didn't do it again. Um... I had stolen from, from Kmart. Um, and, uh, I, um, I, it was cheap trick, uh, a cassette tape. And, um, so my sponsor, my sponsor said to me, go in to Kmart. And, um, she's like, sweetheart, you know, they don't make cheap tricks cassettes anymore. Buy the closest thing. So it was a Bon Jovi CD. Um, I walked in, I purchased that Bon Jovi CD, I walked out the door, I walked back in, I said, I need to speak to a manager. I handed the CD to the manager and I said, many years ago I stole from your organization and um, I just bought this and I would like you to return it to your stock. And the guy looked at me like I had three heads. And, um, and the thing is, I will tell you that having made that amends, I will never steal ever again. <laughs> Right? I don't want to walk back in and be like, hi, I ripped off this scarf here, you can have it back. I don't ever want to do that again. But the other thing is, is that I feel like I can walk into any single store and look every single person into the eye because you know what? I, I can stand and I feel clean. I feel honest. I feel proud. Every time I buy something, that, that's what that's about. You know, the thing is, is that if it, if it was about for me, if it was about, and this is based on my own experience, if it was about making a list, becoming willing, and then just changing my behavior and not having that uncomfortable conversation or not going through that action, here's what the steps would look like. Eight, make a list, become willing. Hey, you know what? Fast forward, go to 12. Just don't be a jerk anymore. 
That's what it would be like for me. Right? But, but because of the fact that I had really good sponsorship, and they said, you know, you need to find out how to repair these relationships. When, when I, when I had first, when I, there was one relationship, honestly, that, that the only way to do that was a letter. And the sponsorship that I had at the time said, I didn't harm anybody through the mail, so you need to make a direct amends. And thank God, she said, but you know what, if you really feel like you need to do this, then do it. And that's what I did. I received a letter back. Um, I received a lot of really good information in that letter. And um, because I took that action, there was a traumatic event that happened that, rel- that kind of linked the two of our lives back together. Um, and the thing is, is because of the fact that I was willing, because of the fact that I had good sponsorship, um, you know, to the extent that that relationship has been able to be repaired, it is. And because of the fact that I went through the rest of the steps and lived them in my life, that relationship and portions of that relationship have been repaired. The other part of it is, is that because of the, that fact, just like Dave was talking about, what I'm able to do at this point is I'm able to be a good partner because I was willing to make that amends. At this point, I'm willing to be a good parent. I don't have kids, but I'm willing to do that today because I was willing to make that amends. I'm a good daughter because I was willing, always willing to make that amends, even during the time that my parents and I weren't speaking. Um, my, my amends right now are littered all over the continental United States. Um, because I, I drank in, in Ohio, Kansas, uh, Michigan, um, and a lot of people still won't speak to me. But the thing is, is that, is that I'm absolutely positively willing to make those amends no matter what, no matter what happens and I cross paths with somebody. Um, and that's, that's probably the biggest, the biggest thing in my life. The other thing is, is that in tying six and seven, eight and nine together is that, you know, it talks about, Nancy said that, it, you know, we do that seven step and it says, take all of me good and bad. Use things, th- those things good and bad. And there was a time in my life that I was like one of these people that like jumped in front of the headlights, right? And I was like getting uh, the sponsor and you guys probably know who it is by now, but the sponsor said she was going to put a, 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 a spoon around my neck because I was a big stirrer. Right. And um, so the thing is, I would jump in the middle of situations, and I thought that I was like the Justice League, right? And I needed to, like, you know, tell everybody what was going on. And so there was, like, this love triangle that was going on over here, right? So there was, like, infidelity going on over here, and this was going on. So I felt like I needed to set the world straight and to, like, have, you know, do all this stuff, right? Okay, by the way, for the record, that's a bad plan. But um, so the thing is, is that is that all of that was going on at the time, and what I didn't realize is that one of the people in that situation, their life was going down the tubes in the name of drug and alcohol, drugs and alcohol. That individual would come to me about a year later, and and I would and I would bring a, a big book in literature to that person. Six months later, that person would um, be admitted into a treatment center. And the last I heard, she was six months sober. So, you know, the the thing is, is that I never know on a daily basis. I mean, now granted, I, I'm not wild about jumping in front of headlights anymore. But at the same time, you know, I I, I understand that the that you know person number one, you know, I jumped in front of headlights. I harmed somebody, and I have an amends sitting out here that's ready to be made, because I hurt this person. I tattled on her and said, you know, you know, I got her in big trouble. I wrecked a relationship. But at the same time, because of the fact that I was a, a really bad person, something good came of it. Am I, you know, was I wrong? Absolutely. Do I own amends? Absolutely. When I cross paths, am I making amends? Oh, heck yeah. But at the same time, I also need to say that some good came of that. Um, I'm, I no longer, I used to stand up and I used to say that I saw myself as the girl that I saw myself as the girl that projectile vomited. I saw myself as the girl that threw a knife at her boyfriend. 
I no longer see myself as a girl of collection of bad behaviors. I see myself as a girl of collection of everything that's moving more towards um, a spiritual ideal. And every single day that I get up, I got a shot at making it. And I have a better shot because of the fact that I continue to use, you know, these spiritual principles. Thanks. Hi, everybody. My name is Larry. I'm an alcoholic. One of the advantage, disadvantages of speaking last is you have a really tough act to follow. These guys are great. Um, two things before I start. One thing, um, when I got here today and I looked around and I saw all that went into this, the food and all the people that were involved with putting that together and the chairs and the sound and all of that, I thought to myself, there's probably several people that did a lot of work to make this happen and it's usually thankless. So let's thank them. Can I get a round of applause for all the people that did this? And the second thing is I got here a little early and I had a chance to hear the previous panels and uh, I sat there and I have to tell you, I was really taken aback by the gut-wrenching honesty that I heard. Um, it really affected me when I was sitting there, so I also want to uh, thank the previous speakers. I've been a little under the weather and my voice may crack a little bit, so bear with me a little bit. Um, my home group is the 12 Steps to Life group, which meets on Tuesday nights in Dundalk at 7 o'clock. Uh, this coming Tuesday, we'll be celebrating our 27th group anniversary, and there'll be food at 6.30. So if you're looking for a party on Tuesday night, by all means, come on down. Um, I've lived in Maryland for 10 years, and I love it here, and I consider myself a as they would say it, a Merlander now. <laughs> but uh, you, if you haven't figured out from listening to me for a few minutes, I'm originally from New York. I grew up there. I got drunk there, and I got sober there. Um, the crowd of guys I got sober with were old-school hardheads. Um, so I, that's what was given to me. So that's a little bit of what I'm going to share with you. That's how it was given to me. I come from the, uh, the old school. I was at a meeting in San Diego at Ronald McDonald House, and I learned that it was a rehab long before there was a Ronald McDonald. And in fact, well, we like to be possessive of AA in the East Coast and in the Midwest because it all started here. But the fact is that the Ronald McDonald Rehab House is one of the three oldest rehabs in the United States, again, before it was called Ronald McDonald. So I went to a meeting there, and there was a grizzled old, old-timer sitting in the back, and somebody was sharing, and I was two or three seats away from them, and he was commenting on the sharing. And one of the things he said was, Ah, that guy came in too soon. If you get here and you still have a watch, you came in too soon. Come back after you lose your watch. <laughs> and, you know, there was a part of me that loved that guy. <laughs> you know, I identify with him a little bit. Um, I was a broken down person when I got here in every way, spiritually, emotionally, physically. I was physically sick, mentally deranged. And uh, I didn't have, you know, two nickels to rub together or any kind of socially acceptable statement to make about what my life was like at that point in time. Um, my first sponsor, and this is one of many coincidences in my life that I've come to believe after the fact were, of course, not coincidences. My first sponsor was a retired New York City detective, which made perfect sense because I was a retired New York City criminal, so it was a, <laughs> it, it was a great fit. <laughs> and uh, early on, you know, when I came in, I and this will be probably the thing today I'm going to say that will be hardest for you to believe based on my current follic condition. But when I got here, I had really, really long hair. And uh, my eyes were yellow and I had a beard and I did not smell well. And I was shaky and sick and pretty miserable. And, and um. I was talking to him early on, somewhere in my first week or two, and he said, you're lying. And I said, how do you know? And he said, your lips are moving. And it was really true. I was in such a delirious state, I could not differentiate. It wasn't as if I was consciously, I was too sick to have like some devious plot going. I just could no longer tell real from false. I, I couldn't tell. Um, 
So my recovery was long and slow and ongoing. Um, what I present to you now is a borderline socially acceptable human being, which is big progress from what I was like when I got here. Um, steps eight and nine. When I got to step eight, um, well, first of all, my sponsor started taking me through the steps. Again, old school. He said there are three questions that you have to answer before you can progress through and at, to the next step. And he said, with you, since you're so smart, we're going to make it really clear. First, what does the step actually say? Because when I got here and I read the steps, they didn't say what they said. You know, us alcoholics, you hand an alcoholic a book, they're not going to read the black part of the page. They're going to read the white part of the page. And I read a lot into things that just wasn't there. So first we had to be really clear that we agreed on what the step actually said. And that may seem really basic, but I'll tell you, I've gone through that in the intervening years with some sponsees, and it's a very valuable exercise. You'd be amazed what sometimes we think is there that's not there. And for me, at least, that's stayed with me for a long time. The second thing he said, now once we agree on what it actually says, what does it ask you to do? Somebody in the earlier panels talked about this being an action program, not a thinking program, and I was twitching in my seat because I was like, that's right, that's right, that's right. What does the step actually ask you to do? In the eighth step, it asks us to make a list and become willing. Okay, so, you know, I, I'm a great alcoholic. I, I make a list of the people who I have harmed. Okay, and the first guy that goes on the list is a fellow that swindled me out of $250,000 who I'm plotting to kill. So I put him on the list first. And, of course, I have this backwards. It's people that I have harmed, not who have harmed me. And, um, but as I said, the directions weren't clear at the beginning. So I make this list, and I put all these people on there, my mother, my father. And, you know, the other thing that was on the list was there were pages of females. And um, and one of the things that happens when you get guidance with a sponsor and they and you talk about this stuff is things. Some of these exercises become fabulous weapons, fabulous hammers on the on the blocks of ice of our denial. You know, the fourth step, the fifth step inventory turns out to be fourth step inventory turns out to be an, a a real, real mallet on your denial about whether or not you're an alcoholic. If you're mad at an institution like a prison or a hospital or a rehab, there's a good chance you're an alcoholic. Normal people do not have resentments towards those three institutions. They've never been inside of them. <laughs> you know, I'm still waiting to meet the normal, balanced family that says, hey, kids, get your stuff. We're packing up and going to a rehab for vacation. If you've been in a rehab, you have a problem with alcohol or another substance. It's a denial breaker. So when I made my eighth-step list and there were all these women on the list, being a terminally unique alcoholic, I'm sure I'm the only one in the room who had this thought. I said, wow, this is going to be a great redating tool. Because <laughs> the ninth step says something about making direct amends, so I'm going to get to talk to all these babes again. And I'm sure they're just dying to hear from me. This is going to be fabulous. <laughs> and then the detective stepped into the picture. <laughs> And he starts crossing stuff up. No, you're not talking to her. No, you're not talking to her. No, you're not. Why not? Because this is about making amends. He said, Larry, get a dictionary. So I've got a dictionary. He said, look up some words. Let's start with amends. And I still hear this a lot. I'm going to be curmudgeonly about this. I hear a lot of people talking about eighth and ninth steps, talking about amends as apologies. Well, I went to so-and-so, and I apologized, so I made my amends. Nonsense. Apologies have nothing to do with amends. I am a great apologizer. I'm an alcoholic. I spent 20 years on a bar stool apologizing. You know, come home three days after I was supposed to. My wife's throwing crap at me. Where the hell were you? Oh, honey, I'm really sorry. I'll never do it again. I spent my whole drunken life apologizing. Apologies are useless coming from an alcoholic. And amends means a repair. You have to fix it. Apologies don't fix anything. You have to fix it. So that upset me. Um, 
And then he took the guy off that I had on the list who had swindled me out of a quarter of a million dollars. He said, you're not talking to him. <laughs> that upset me. And, uh, and, and I, he said, okay, you've made your list. Now let's talk about the willingness. He said, willingness, like gratitude, is, is not, is an action. If you're grateful for your recovery, you demonstrate your gratitude in your actions. Don't waste any time talking about gratitude. He said, if I have one more pigeon who comes back to me with his chest stuck out bragging about something he did, I'm going to get sick. He said, real gratitude means you do good stuff for other people and you don't feel the need to tell anyone else about it. That upset me. <laughs> and then he said, now this willingness thing, you can talk about willingness to you blue in the face. We're talking about willingness doesn't mean anything. Willingness is an action. You prove your willingness by taking an action. You're willing to do something about this list? Okay, run along and do something about this list. Start talking to people. Don't talk to anybody without talking to me. My first two years, his motto for me was don't just do something, stand there. <laughs> um, and I have to tell you that my process of nine step amends, which was slow and ongoing, was not, um, there, it wasn't charming. There was a lot of poignancy in it. Um, not that long ago, I called up a cousin of mine, and I'm 54, my cousin's 12 years older than me, and, um, Part of my point of calling him, I hadn't spoken to him in many years, and part of my point of calling him was to finally straighten some things out on the ninth step. And I spent a few minutes talking to him, and then he put his wife on the phone for a minute, and then I got back on the phone with him, and by the time I got done talking to his wife, I understood what was going on. He's in the early stages of some sort of dementia or Alzheimer's situation. So I, I got scared before I talked to her, and she straightened me out a little bit because he was really weird. He was all over the place. It was hard to follow the conversation, and and I knew that this was just not going to happen now. And, um, you know, time is a great equalizer. And, uh, you know, I can't say I have no regrets. I regret that I didn't get to him sooner. Um, my amends with my mother was bizarre. It was like we sat down at her little kitchen table, and again, I was fairly new, and I don't know, I guess it was murky for me at the beginning, so around the year was by the time I got to the ninth step and I was getting ready to talk to her, and um, I started telling her stuff, and she was like, she didn't really want to hear this, she was like, I lived this, I know all of this stuff, you don't have to recount for a list. And you're my son, and I love you, and don't worry about it. Forgot about it. Let's move on. It was very unfulfilling. It upset me. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm an egotistical and selfish and defiant alcoholic, and it's all about me. My ninth step has to carry some emotional payload for me. <laughs> and there was none in that. Um, I was about eight or nine years sober when she died. And um, after she died, I discovered that I had been adopted. And um, I believe today that a large part of why she felt the need to carry that to the grave was my behavior, my 30 years of drinking. She didn't trust me. She didn't trust our love enough to feel like she could come clean with that and I would still love her. And I... I played a part in that. That's not all in her head. I, I danced with her for her whole, for my whole life. And that's the price of the dance that I paid, that I did with her. Um, is that I have carried that knowledge that she felt unable to trust me with this information. Trust our relationship really with that information. Um, some ninth step amends have been really interesting in other ways. I, uh, oh, that was the other thing on my list. Talk about denial. My eighth step list had a lot of things like first criminal attorney, second criminal attorney, <laughs> third criminal attorney, because I had stiffed all of them for the money I owed them, divorce attorney. And my sponsor did not hesitate to point out that people who live responsibly in society 
don't have interactions with these people and don't owe them money. So that was another, yet another hammer on the hammer on the mallet of the denial of my disease. Um, so when I was, it took a while. Like I said, I was a sick puppy when I got here. It took a while to to gain some footing in society, financial, physical, spiritual. When I was about nine years sober, I was finally self-sustaining financially, and I could and I could straighten out some amends with those guys. And I wrote some checks and and paid them. And um, some of them, I mean, they were all over the place. I couldn't find some of them. Some of them, I had to send them a letter. I couldn't track them down. Um, and I sent one guy a letter and a check. And I tried to be humble in the letters, which, if you can't tell already, is a real work in progress for me. <laughs> but I tried to be humble in the letters and say, you know, you may remember me. I'm the guy who screwed you out of $3,000 when you <laughs> kept me out of jail for life. And, you know... I'm sorry I wasn't more grateful about it at the time. And, <laughs> and, um, and uh, this guy was my last criminal attorney, and, and he was still wrapping stuff up when I was a few months sober. And at that time, I was looking at multiple felonies, and the, the district attorney of Queens County in New York really thought it was a good idea for society for me to go away for about 25 years. And this lawyer was so good, he kept postponing and postponing and postponing and waiting for the DA to get less pissed off because the crime I had been accused of occurred around the corner from his house. So he took it personally that this crime had been committed in his neighborhood and didn't I know who he was? You know, I guess he had a little ego, but in any event. Um, so this guy kept postponing it, kept postponing it, waiting for this guy to cool off, and eventually they made a deal, and I wound up with no felony conviction and lots and hundreds of hours of community service. And uh, this guy really did a magic act because I should still be in jail. You know, if we're talking about, I get, you know, if we're talking about justice, you know, I received mercy, not justice. Um, so anyway, I sent this guy a check and finally nine years later, and um, he wrote me back a letter and he said, uh, not only do I remember you, Turns out we have a mutual acquaintance that I wasn't aware he was still in touch with. He said, but I've been kind of listening to your story over the last nine years through this other guy. And he said, uh, it was a privilege to defend you. He said, it was a privilege to know you. And he said, anything I can do for you in the future, no matter what it is, you can always call on me if you need help. And, um, you know, that guy is a lot more evolutionarily evolved than I am. <laughs> if, the, if the tale had been reversed, I don't know that I would have been all that gracious about it. You know, My response would have been something like, you dumb crackhead, where the hell's my money and what took you so long? Um, but I, you know, that, so it's a mixed bag. There was some poignance, some, some tough stuff. And, and that's kind of how I find recovery. You know, I bounce along thinking I know what's going to happen and it almost never turns out the way I think it's going to turn out. Um, my sponsor told me I have a, uh, a broken meter determining what's good and bad. That often, almost always what I think is good for me is going to be bad for me. And almost always what I think is going to be bad for me turns out to be good for me. And that's still true a lot of the time. It's a work in progress. And uh, I think we're just about out of time, so that's what I've got for you. And thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.